All right. So today's lecture is usually a first lecture, but I did the Android intro yesterday. Uh, I had uh, cut down some of the um, some of the material that related to SS7 and kind of uh, underlying technologies related to the normal telephony systems. They are becoming less and less relevant. But I will just highlight kind of a um, um, couple of things. So the first one is, um, do you know what SS7 is? It's an underlying technical specification for the normal telephony that we've used for years and some of the telecommunication companies for landlines are still using. Um, what's interesting about the the standard is that if you know it, it has been designed you know 20 30 years ago and it allowed a lot of technical things that we see as um, uh, we see today as kind of um, at the forefront uh, for example micropayments right um, you know we, we still haven't solved the problem of micropayments in the internet uh, era uh, there are a lot of proposals and there is a lot of things that are happening, but you know if you think about it Telcos had billing per second for years before the internet happened. They could charge your calls You know per minute or per second even uh, and that was still it was allowed because the technological specification was allowing that to, 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 to be possible and it was across different vendors and different suppliers and different manufacturers and so on right so it was kind of a, a marvelous agreement that all those people around the world agree upon. And technologically, it was something easy that we still struggle today because we don't have kind of a, a, a well-defined and well-working global micropayment system in the, in the internet, right? So I would like you to remember the, that term. Um, uh, what else? Uh, I would like you to tell me what's the difference between circuit switching and packet switching. What do you think? So, circuit switching or packet? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good good analogy, right? So this would be more hardware, this would be more software, right? Um, why it is, so the normal telephony, like, okay, um, if we kind of step back, how the normal telephony worked? Well, we you have kind of an end user somewhere with the telephone, um, and then you have another end user, somewhere with the telephone, right? And how is it possible that they talk? Well, they have to have a wire going from one telephone to the other, and then they can send the electrical signals encoding their voice, and they can talk with one another, right? So that's how the normal telephony works, right? How is that possible? Well, initially when, you know, Bell guy developed this, they just wired a wire between two rooms in the office, right? but it doesn't scale that well. So what we have to have in the middle is some sort of exchange, right? So in here, I have to plug my cable to some sort of exchange. Uh, and here I have to plug my cable to some sort of exchange. And then I have to have the telcos doing the core network for me. So then people can actually talk, right? So what happens is you have you have your home wired to the uh, local exchange on your street. That local exchange on your street is wired to a bigger exchange in your city. And then the bigger exchange in your city is wired to even bigger one in your country. And then the bigger one in the country is wired to another one in another country. And then the whole thing kind of works, right? Because when you dial a number, you're dialing the uh, the particular sequence of numbers which kind of create a wired connection 
between all those different exchanges, and eventually there is a wire going between you and the destination, right? So if you call someone in US over the landline, it doesn't work anymore like this, but if you called someone like in US on the landline phone 20 years ago, you would have a wire going from your home to that person's home, which was delegate, dedicated for you only, right? And that's how it worked, and that's how it worked for years. And if you have more and more people coming here, what happens is you have to have more and more wires being in the core network because for all those people talking with each other, they have to have the wire connecting them, right? So you see already there is a problem, right? Scaling, when population grows, when they open, you know, uh, telephony in India or in China or whatever, then suddenly the core networks are like, poof, you have to install those really fat cables underground with like, you know, thousands of, you know, copper lines and you have to dig the, the cables in the ground, install it, and so this, this became really challenging for the telecommunication companies to scale to the worldwide demands, right? So when, when you uh, started um, using your modems, for example, yeah, you probably didn't, but if you used the analog modems back in the day, uh, you would call somebody and you would have this wire between yourself and then you can do whatever you want on that wire, right? Uh, you could use it for voice, which was the normal use case, but you could use it for data streams as well. So you could encode uh, traffic using, yeah, you can use voice, but you can also use data, right? You can use a, whatever electrical encodings you want because you basically have a connection between you and somebody else. And that's how the early internet systems work. They had this kind of... Uh, uh, bulletin board type of setup where you would be dialing to someone, you will be passing some information to them and then they would be doing the same for their friends and then some people would become some sort of a relays. So someone in the middle would kind of be the one which calls a lot of people and you can pass information this way, right? Um, once you have the scalability problem here, what can you do? Well, you kind of go from hardware switching, circuit switching, to packet switching, right? How many cables do I need to, to have here to connect um, two people on this end talking to two people on this end? Normally, I need two cables, right? Because if those two pairs talk at the same time, I have to have two, two cables running in my core network, right? If I switch to packet switching, how many cables do I need to run here? One, okay? Because I don't need two connections, I just need to have one connection and I have to encode, uh, encode the voice, cut them into packets, and half of the packets will be for these guys to talk, and half of the packets will be for these guys to talk, and it works fine, right? Up to the limit capacity of that channel, right? So how do we know how many people we can have here? Well, there is a field of science called information science. Um, so we have information science. Uh, and then there is a guy, Claude Shannon. Which he, he did a master thesis and he basically explained what we can do on channels like this, right? So his master thesis is the most cited master thesis in the world because we use it for everything, right? Um, so there was a shift from circuit switching to packet switching because of the limitations of the telephony networks, right? So then, you know, we had this picture, we kind of uh, were changing the, the, the things from analog uh, analog telephony to void, right? Because you have to have voice encoded into packets, right? When you have cables, you don't encode voice as packets, you would just encode voice as, as kind of stream, as analog signals. And when you call, call here, you know, you, your voice is being decoded into some analog signal and goes on the wire, right? So it goes on, on the wire up to this point. It's kind of like a border of the core network. Um, so this is called the, the last exchange and you, it's called last mile, right? 
and the rest here is called core, core network. Um, and then in the core network, it would get converted into VoIP, voice over IP, and then you would the signals would go like this, right? So for a while, your analog telephony, and, and I don't know whether you've, you've noticed it, but it, it happened around mid-2000s, where the telcos in different countries ro rolled uh, the core network to be uh, digital instead of analog, right? So when you were making calls, I mean, you know, I'm old, right? So I was making calls when there was no internet. And when you make calls in those days, the quality of the sound was superb, right? It was like superb. And then in around mid 2000s, when in New Zealand they rolled over the, the telephony to be, um, be void based, suddenly the quality of the sound was like Skype, was like shit, right? <laughs> it's like, what happened? And what happened was that you didn't have analog telephony anymore, you had digital telephony. And they basically were like Skype internally, right? They were digitizing your voice into packets using some codecs and doing that, right? And it took them a few years to get up to the levels that we have now. The computers were slower, the technology was less mature, and we were doing the voice conversions kind of in a crappy way, right? Uh, Skype improved as well, right? So now Skype quality is better than it was 10 years ago. And the same is for the telephony. Like now when you talk on the phone, the quality is not too bad, right? Um, but it's not analog telephony anymore. Um, <clears throat> All right, so when this was happening and these guys were moving to the uh, digital core network, at the same time, another revolution was happening, which was the, you know, uh, I don't know how to draw it, which was the mobile revolution, right? Instead of using wired telephony, we had this explosion of mobile devices being deployed and the towers being installed and, you know, Suddenly, these guys decided, well, and they had a separate infrastructure for all of that, right? They were having the old infrastructure for the uh, landline type of telephony, and they have this new infrastructure coming up for the mobile telephony. So you have to have the end towers, you have to have the centers which kind of congregate the signals, and you have to manage that, right? So there was the, a new push, again, mid-2000s, which said, well, maintaining two systems makes no sense, right? First of all, the analog telephony, the old landline telephony is going away. It's, it's being replaced uh, by mobile, by wireless. Um, and second of all, this is being kind of used for not analog voice chats, but for data, right? So we have fiber. I don't want to talk to this guy. I want to send him a movie over a fiber optic cable Right? So the demands of this end-to-end -end connectivity changed as well. So we had another thing which was happening in that, in that space, in this messy picture, which is called convergence, right? So convergence was happening. And what is convergence? Convergence is basically saying everything will go over IP, right? No matter what you do, no matter what you need to send, no matter what we are dealing with, at the bottom layer, it will be an IP traffic, right? why it will be an IP traffic? Well, because IP is the core fundamental technology for internet. And they've seen that, you know, effectively in the long run, everything will converge to internet. We will be sending video, voice, data, everything over internet protocol, right? You, you know what IP is, right? Internet protocol. Um, so IP is the big keyword here. Uh, and fast forward a few years and, you know, you're not surprised. I mean, you know, voice data, video, Netflix, everything goes over IP, right? In the telco, it's actually the same. So if you're dealing with old-fashioned telco companies, they basically do everything in the core network over IP these days, right? Um, they, they, they kind of cheat too because uh, IP has some, some limitations, so you may kind of say they do everything over Ethernet because there are, there are different stacks they use internally. They don't have to use the, pro the open internet protocol. They can do some shortcuts, some, some cheats. So convergence is another term that you should know, right? Um, and why it is important? Well, because some business models and some, some evolution of the, of the technologies and the, uh, the way we perceive certain things is fundamentally old. <laughs> Right? You say, oh yeah, Twitter is new or something is new. It's not new. Like, we've been doing things like that for ages. 
you know, location-based services are new. They are not new. We had location-based services when we had very early mobile phones already, right? Uh, all those things were kind of old. What has changed, though, is that we democratized access to those things, to those technologies, right? In, back in the day, only big telco companies could have apps which were location-based. Now you can write in this course location-based app and distribute it to everybody and make money on it, right? Go back 20 years and you were not able to do that if you were not a big corporation which owned all the infrastructure, right? So the models didn't change. The models are the same. The technology didn't change. In fact, some technical things which we had 20 years ago are still superb to what we have now, right? Uh, but what changed is that it got democratized. Like everybody now has access to everything, so to speak, in very broad metaphor. So you can, as I'm saying, you can do location-based service, some game or what, what, what you want, as a single individual person, distribute it to millions of people and make business model out of it, right? Back in the day, you couldn't do that. But you could do it if you were the corporation, right? The technology was there. The capabilities were there. And, you know, you may ask why they were not doing it, why we never had those kind of things. And the, the reality is for many reasons, right? They, they were some applications for a very uh, professional consumers, which were, being, which were paying the telcos for certain extras. And those apps were kind of developed or those systems were developed. Um, so it's not like saying that it, it never existed. It existed, but why they were doing it for uh, normal people? Um, and uh, there are multiple reasons. Like uh, I had a discussion recently with a, with a friend and he was saying we could have done YouTube on mobile phones like 20 years ago because we had the capabilities, right? The network transfers were a little bit weak. So the quality would be kind of a low end YouTube speeds in uh, current terms. But we knew it will get improved, right? Over years, we would have YouTube much earlier, right? Why it didn't happen? For a lot of reasons, for political reasons and also for the mindset reasons, right? Uh, the mindset of those big corporations is that the world is not changing fast, right? We will do it when we need to do it, right? And look at Nokia, for example, that was the mindset. Like why Nokia is not a giant mobile you know, platform anymore? Because they were a big giant platform and they thought, well, this internet thing, those mobile smartphones thing, you know, it's, you know, we will jump on it when we need to. We have those feature phones. We are the dominant player. I don't know whether you use Nokia phones, but they were superb. They were like miles ahead of the competition back in the day. Uh, and they dominated the market. They were like, you know, huge. Um, and look at them now, like they basically disappeared, right? They uh, irrelevant. Um, why? Because they were slow in, in doing things, right? And because the markets uh, changed and they kind of democratized things, now everybody is doing everything and everything is going much faster, right? So with those big corporations, it's a little bit difficult to uh, keep up. So that's kind of like a very brief hand wavy introduction which I would spend like an hour and a half explaining all the details and telling you all the technical technologies behind all of this. But I think that's what you need to take out of the other lecture, right? Uh, so there is a background, there is a history. Uh, there are a couple of keywords like SS7, Convergence, uh, Claude Shannon with the ca channel capacity uh, and information science uh, and the reliance on, on IP protocols and internet uh, protocols. There is one um, there is one um, more thing that I wanted to um, to highlight here. Um, yeah, I will. It, it will come back. Um, all right. So let's let's move on with the with the lecture. Uh, so we kind of starting the lecture from the point one audio communication. We kind of skip that. Uh, and we're going into mobile. So the initial mobile systems were kind of analog based, right? Uh, we were not doing um, packet switching yet, and we were transferring voice over analog signal, um, and it, it, it worked. Um, but um, it was sort of focused on voice only, right? So when people had the technical capabilities, so you could have a mobile device in your car, because carrying it in the backpack was still too heavy, right? The mobile hand headsets were not only bulky, they required uh, like a big uh, 
suitcase level kind of equipment to, to work, right? So imagine you have a kind of a big suitcase and a mobile headset that was the you know, initial mobile phone, right? So it wasn't really for humans, it was kind of for cars, <laughs> right? Because someone has to carry the, that suitcase. So they were kind of thinking, okay, it's about voice, right? So someone in the car can talk to someone at home or whatever, right? Um, and the important thing was that um, we sort of, um, as uh, engineers, we separated what is the data plane and what is the control plane, right? It's a very trivial thing, but if you think about it, um, it's, you know, you can do, um, so if you have a problem to solve, okay? Let's say you have, um, you are designing Twitter, okay? Uh, so you have, um, you have a person, and then you have another person, and you want to allow them to do two things. Pro one thing is, this person can broadcast something, so they can say a broadcast message, right? So uh, on Twitter, you can uh, send a message, and it kind of goes to everybody, right? Uh, it's, that, it's that kind of a broadcast message. That, so that's one thing they can do. The second thing they can do is they can send a private message, right? So if this person uses a private message, it only goes to that recipient, right? So I have a kind of a private message and, um, and broadcast message. And I have a channel. So I'm saying, okay, a user can prepare the message and push it through this channel, right? So I have a data plane, right? So this is my data plane. So now I have the choice. How do I do control? How do I distinguish between a message which should be a broadcast and a message which should be to that recipient? How is Twitter doing that? How, how you send a private message in Twitter? Are you not using Twitter? All right, okay. <laughs> Right, so um, if you send a message, um, if, you, if you have a text which starts with anything and push it into the data plane, it becomes a broadcast message. But if you push a message which starts with at recipient and then the message, then this message becomes a private message, okay? So the control is done inside the data plane of what that means, right? Um, so you have mixed a data plane with control plane on the same channel. You don't have a second channel which negotiates between a end user and the Twitter server of what it is. You're just using the same channel for control information and for the data, right? So if you go to telephony, uh, if, I have, um, if I have a user and, and a device, and I have another user and a device, and the user wants to talk to another user, it has to establish kind of a connectivity, right? And then once the connectivity is established, I have a kind of a voice data plane, which I can send voice over, right? But the negotiation and the kind of establishing establishment of the voice, that goes over a different channel, which is called control plane, right? They separate it. So the data or the voice flows on one channel, and then negotiations or agreements about the data channel goes on a different channel, right? So the telcos were built like that historically because when you're dialing a number, you have to send a lot of... Um, sort of um, information to the exchanges before the, the circuit is established. So there is kind of an additional line, so to speak, of how this is being negotiated. And then once the circuit is established, then you have the kind of the data plane, right? What is the advantage of doing that? Well, the advantage is that you have sort of people having access to that cannot attack you 
and mess up with the way the negotiations are done, right? Because that has nothing to do with negotiations, right? It has only to do with that data passing. And as a side effect, this control plane is kind of famous for being reused for, uh, so, so initially this has never been shown to the users, like users never seen that, right? So if you kind of go to the exchange, you have one line, and that line is only kind of a data, and here I have data and control, and the control plane is never, like you have no access to it, right? Uh, in, in the old days when the circuit switching was done. Uh, with, with the packet switching, it, you know, it always goes on the same cable, but it's kind of logically separated, right? And if you logically separated it, then users don't have access to it, but they have access to that. But it changed because telcos realized that, you know, this has particular capacity. You can use it for sending data. They are using it for sending data to negotiate the protocols, right? And this is mostly not used, right? So they said, okay, maybe we can let users use it for sending short messages, right? And they call it SMS, you know, short message service, right? So they said, oh, well, you know, most of the time we don't use that channel at all. So, and people not always talk with each other. They don't have to send the data. You don't have to have a fat pipe to transmitting data or voice. You know, we can use it. And that was all the, all the way back into the past packet-based, right? It was always packet-based, the, the control plane, right? It was signaling. So they say, okay, you know, most of the time it's not used, so let's let make people use it, okay? So now we have SMS, which is going over the uh, um, control plane, but you have some side effects, okay? The side effects are that the control plane doesn't have any quality of service, right? This one has, because you're negotiating, what is the, you know, uh, data plane quality of service, how the things are delivered. This one isn't, right? So this one is sort of best effort, right? And it's unreliable, right? And the messages sometimes are cute and sometimes are not delivered, right? Have you experienced that? That SMS is kind of working most of the time, but sometimes it doesn't, especially like towards the New Year's Eve or something, everybody's sending SMSs to everybody and suddenly, you know, it stops working, right? Sure, because it, it has a limited capacity, right? Um, so they kind of uh, use this and from security point of view, the design which separates what you're doing with how you control it is kind of better than the design where everything is bangled together, right? Um, so when, um, when Twitter started very early on, they had some, uh, some problems because people were abusing uh, or attacking uh, the, the way the servers work by messing up with what they were sending, right? Uh, if they separated the two things, then the attacks would have no impact on the data plane of the other users, right? But because it's the same thing, then it had kind of influence. All right, so that's one additional kind of uh, take, take home thing. Uh, how you're organizing your things and how you're signaling what you're doing between your data channel and your uh, control, control channel. So... <clears throat> 1G, a very high power output, the towers were sparse, so you have to have devices which are quite powerful to transmit the signal to a tower far away because they were not frequent. Uh, 2G, well, you had more and more towers, they were getting closer and closer to each other, so the head, head, handsets could become uh, smaller and less powerful, right? So the towers are powerful, but your handset is of very limited power. To transmit to the to the receiver, you don't need a lot of uh, output power anymore. 3G, of course, you all experienced the shift from 2G to 3G, which you know you appreciate it by having faster internet access, right? Now we are in a kind of move towards 4G, and the 5G specs are kind of worked upon, right? So the 5G is coming. Uh, there are tests already uh, running, um, and what it means for you, it means faster access, less latency, and more programmable network layer. You can negotiate what you need the network for and then get the best for, for yourself, right? So for telcos, it means they can optimize their internals because everything is more software defined. Um, there are some interesting um, um, items, for example, the migration to IPv6 and kind of a peer-to-peer -peer capabilities, right? So currently, if you have 
let's say you have two phones um, and one is at home and one is in the car. If someone calls you, you cannot really route quickly between the, the two phones, right? But if you have the protocols which allow you to kind of negotiate it and, and switch over, you can say, I want to take that call on the other phone, right? And then the phone get the, the phone call just get routed to the device that you want, right? Uh, and you can also, telcos are also looking at peer-to-peer, -peer, so, you know, not everything needs to go through them, right? If you can talk to this person over another uh, means, then you can have a connectivity based peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Currently, it's not possible. Let's say a disaster happens and the uh, GSM tower is wiped in Jovic and I cannot call you, right? But I have a device which can transmit and you have a device that can receive, right? If we close to each other, why I cannot call you? Uh, well, because we design system not to work like this, right? But with 5G, we can do that. We can have systems which kind of allow people to call each other without going through the GSM tower, if necessary, right? Which would be really handy for disaster situations or for some ad hoc networks, right? Uh, I'm not sure if that's going to happen for voice because it's quite hard, but it definitely is going to happen for data, right? Um, all right, so we kind of reached the, the end point of this slide. Um, analog encodings were good quality-wise. I still remember like how, how it felt. Uh, digital encodings are heavy in processing power, so the, the shift is into the kind of a data centers and network pipelines. That's why the core network is all fiber now. There is no copper anymore because that makes no sense, right? Uh, and also, like when they went upgrading, right? They have the, the choice of putting this big copper cable into the ground and knowing, okay, in half a year we have to put another copper cable like that into the ground or using instead of this, using a fiber and putting that into a ground and say, we have enough capacity to last us for two or three generations, right, uh, of upgrades because we have so much capacity in fiber that we will not need to upgrade for a while. Of course, they pick the second option, right? <clears throat> So it's much, you know, digital, software-defined, and packet-based is much more flexible and much easier to upgrade and maintain. <clears throat> All right. So we have two slides uh, about thin client versus um, uh, fat clients. Um, why are we talking about it? Well, you know, for historical reasons a little bit. You know all of that from the cloud course, and you know that there is a model where devices are just windows to kind of more computer, computational resource. So if you play an online game, sometimes everything is sort of rendered and run on the servers and your device is just a kind of a window, right? It's a kind of a thin client model. Or you're participating in the game where you have a lot of GPU and processing done on your local machine and you're only exchanging the state with all the other players, in which case you have a fat client model, right? So those are the two fundamental model. So it depends of where the power is, where the computational power or storage is, right? Uh, if you have a large supercomputer like or a cloud service, you want a lot of terminals, right? Uh, and those terminals are kind of thin clients. So that's easy. Um, and that kind of translates to the mobile phones, right? So you can have thin mobiles. And there was conception initially that it's better for the corporations to have a thin mobile model because then they kind of centrally control more, right? Um, it kind of didn't really happen this way. Uh, the manufacturers put more and more hardware into the mobile phones and the mobile phones are now kind of like, you know, uh, very decent computers. Um, so the model, even though it was sort of um, uh, designed this way, didn't really work. And the prob original problems were that, you know, uh, if you have a thin mobile uh, device and uh, or say tablet, you really need networking and really good one all the time, right? Nothing really works offline if you cut off, right? If you have a fat client, you can cache, you can do a lot more things than with the thin mobile model, right? So it had kind of a lot of problems. Um, so... Um, <clears throat> There is a tension, right? So now we have a question. Was an iPhone a first smartphone? Who thinks it was? So nobody thinks it was. So what was the first smartphone? Ericsson. 
Yeah, good question, right? So we have to define the terms, okay? So was the iPhone released before Android? What, which one was first, an iPhone or Android? That is a clearly defined question. Windows? Windows Mobile? Windows CE? All right, let's have a look. So I Googled it. And iPhone was released on, in June and uh, Android was released a year later, right? So Android is a little bit younger than iPhone. But the very first smartphone that we put our hands on was neither Android or iPhone. So the, the very first smartphone we put our hands on with Chris was this one. Remember that one? <laughs> it's an open Moco. It's an open hardware, open software mobile platform that was released almost exactly when iPhone was released, right? And you never heard of it, right? <laughs> you should, because uh, for many reasons. One, for example, that it never worked as a phone. You couldn't use it as a phone because it was a bit broken. Um, second, that when your battery ran out, you cannot charge your battery because the battery charging driver requires to run to charge the battery. <laughs> yeah, <I'm poof. laughs> so what do you have to do? Well, you have to basically find, and the booting also wouldn't work, right? So if you plug a USB and try to charge it, the phone wouldn't boot, right? So what you have to do is you have to find another phone which has a battery charged, put that battery to your phone, boot it, then keep running it on the USB power, take that battery out, put the flat battery in and charge it. That's why we bought two, right? <laughs> because if we bought one, we would get screwed. Uh, but it was very nice. It was completely Linux-based. It was completely open-sourced. And it was completely open-hardware as well. And why it's so amazing? Well, it's amazing because um, my telco manufacturers, they have to go through a very uh, detailed process of uh, allowing the hardware to be used in the phones, right? And they are very protective about it. So that you have in all your phones, they are kind of chips, which the manufacturer only know how they work and nobody else knows, right? Um, and these guys were trying to have kind of a handset which anybody can build themselves. Uh, so it was sort of very highly praised as a... Um, yeah, as a, an open platform. We don't have phones like that yet, right? It, it happened like in 2007, fast forward 11 years, and we still don't have those type of phones on the market, right? But it was a very visionary uh, project. It kind of got killed because uh, for many reasons, one of which was that it kind of appealed to geeks and it was kind of a good platform to work with, but it wasn't really working as a phone, right? Um, why? Well, because they didn't work out exactly all these open firmware things that ne were needed for the for the GSM compatibility. Um, and they couldn't make kind of investment, like nobody wanted to go against the telcos back in the day. Uh, nobody really invested into the platform, so it sort of died. But um, yeah, it was quite nice. I mean, you were using it with a stylus, uh, and you were kind of having the UI, which was sort of Linux driven, and the programming, it was easy. It was sort of like programming Linux, right? Um, all right, so that came almost exactly the same as iPhone, right? Um, <clears throat> but the first smartphone I could find out was this one. So this one was uh, an IBM smartphone, which was released in 92, but the, coin, the, the term was coined in 95, right? So even though the product was released earlier, uh, they kind of didn't refer to it as a smartphone. It was sort of... Uh, coined a little bit later. And what it had, it had email, it had uh, phone and fax capabilities, it had a touch screen, it had a kind of a personal digital assistant apps, calendar, organizer, things like this, right? So you may say, well, did it have web browser? Uh, it didn't have a web browser, but it had email, right? So it depends how you define what smartphone is. If smartphone has to have a web browser, <laughs> then it wasn't a smartphone, but I had a, lo a lot of feature phones 
which had a web browser built in and it, I wouldn't call them a smartphone, right? So it depends. Um, so the term kind of goes back. Um, again, it's, you know, putting things into the mobile portable device. It's not new. It, it was, we were doing it for a while. <clears throat> All right, so um, what was the original problem? The problem was that originally we had those thin mobiles uh, and we wanted more. They were, you know, the network was not enough, the bandwidth and uh, throughput was not possible with the telecom networks. We wanted a device which is a little bit more than a thin client, right? We had devices which were thin clients, but they relied on the, on the network connectivity and we wanted something better. So we pushed as a technology, as a community, as you know, computer scientists, as engineers, to have something better, and there is a plethora of innovations which was happening, right? So Windows Mobile, uh, which was replacing Windows CE, uh, I don't know whether you ever had a Windows CE device. I had like a personal assistant kind of thing, uh, which was running Windows CE, and it was pretty usable. It was um, it was kind of like a tiny uh, tiny screen with Windows and with some sort of apps that you could run. Uh, the, they had like an office app, which I had to convert all the files which, because it was kind of a limited resource device, right? So your Word document wouldn't work on it. You have to convert it to this kind of mobile document. Um, and then you could work with it on this device. But it was sort of usable. Um, quite limited. Uh, internet capabilities were very limited. And then Microsoft came up with Windows Mobile, which replaced it, um, and so on. So then we have kind of a Windows Phone. Last year, the death was approaching. Now it's dead, right? The Win uh, Microsoft officially pulled out and killed the project, right? So Microsoft is not playing that game anymore. Another huge player was Palm OS. Um, so the, the PDAs, the concept of the PDA is kind of associated with Palm OS because the, the guy was sort of... A, um, he's famous for actually when they were brainstorming and designing the device. He actually took a piece of wood uh, and was, you know, putting it in his pocket and walking with it on the meetings and pretending how he would use it on the meetings and, you know, in the shops and at home and so on. And he was kind of actually using a piece of wood to sort of uh, make himself think of what this device would be useful for and how he could use it, right? So he came up with the stylus, he came up with the screen uh, with different apps for like organizing meetings and things like that. And they designed a kind of a Palm OS. And Palm OS was sort of very visionary back in the day. It was um, ahead of time with, with, the, with the other systems. And then it was acquired by Hewlett Packard in 2011 and killed. It was acquired to be killed because uh, Hewlett Packard had their own operating system which was competing with the Palm OS, which was called WebOS, okay? Uh, so they bought Palm OS and they killed it and they continue with uh, WebOS. Then there was Migo, which was sort of um, uh, a Linux variant, kind of a Linux on steroids to be really tiny. Uh, that has been replaced by Tizen. Uh, and then Bada, which was also killed and merged with Tizen. Um, and then Symbian, which is the one which uh, Nokia was working on, right? So it originally was only for feature phones, but then they kind of, you know, expanded it. They called it Symbian OS, and it became kind of um, a bigger thing, right? And then there was this famous deal with Microsoft where Nokia agreed to kill Symbian in favor of Windows Phone, which we can see here was killed a few years later, right? Um, so Nokia kind of killed Symbian because Microsoft paid them, you know, $1 billion to do that and not to go with Android, just go with Windows Phone, right? The future of Nokia after that decision is sort of sealed. You can see that, like looking back, you see what is that, right? Why would you that this decision? It was definitely not worth $1 billion, right? Uh, so if they could turn back time and go back to that decision, they probably would say, no, we're not taking your $1 billion. We, we're sticking to our platform or uh, sw sw switching to Android potentially, which would have probably be a better decision. But, you know, we don't know. We can just say if. Um, there was an effort from Firefox called Firefox OS, which was also killed, you know, three years back. 
uh, to, to do this. Um, and then WebOS was never really killed, but you don't see it. You don't have devices uh, which run WebOS, right? It was quite interesting because around um, 2013, when all those other systems were being killed, uh, we had a delegation from Hewlett-Packard to our university, and they said we can. Uh, we are organizing this big, big, big competition for WebOS apps. They had some uh, tablets and they had some phones, and the price was kind of going down like hell on Amazon. And they were you can buy them really cheap, right, for hundred bucks, kind of a very decent hardware tablet running WebOS, right. And everybody was like, why? What, what is happening, right? And it was basically the end of their life. So the, there was not enough uptake, people were not buying them, and they had to basically make the, they had to make some money on it before it was just killed, right? So they were losing money, but they wanted to, uh, um, um, yeah, uh, get some return on the investment, right? And they, they just killed it. But WebOS itself was not killed, it was sort of a license to uh, uh, smart TVs and if you're running LG or something, you probably are running WebOS, right? Uh, you see it on the, as an operating system behind your TVs, it kind of found it home there. Why, uh, while some systems are using Android, um, WebOS kind of find the niche and tailor itself to be better for TV uh, management, right? So it is actually, I would, I would think that WebOS on a TV is probably better than Android on a TV right now, but you know, depending how well they will be maintaining it and using it. All right, so um, we talked a little bit about analog versus digital. Um, we, do you want a break or do you want to finish earlier? Okay, so let's have a five minutes break then. <laughs> 